A group of friends game night turns into a real life mystery when one of them is kidnapped and clapped by unknown assailants. So first thing we see is this guy, Max, at game night with his friends. He meets his lady, Annie. They bond, do their introductions, and boom, they're hanging out on the train. Boom, boom, they're now dating and dominating game nights through the years. And pretty fitting, it seems. Max proposes at a game night with their friends using the game of charades. Even on their wedding day, they're playing games. With these guys, it's quite literally all fun and games until something happens. And then something happens. They're at the hospital because they're having trouble conceiving, but they still manage to create time for games. The doctor tells him that the problem is with Max's baby batter. She thinks it's psychological, so she asks if he has been stressed lately. He says no, but Annie says Max is always a little stressed because of his competitive nature, which is always heightened whenever he's around his brother. And it begins to make sense. Max's brother, Brooks, is coming to town, and Annie says Max has been uptight since he found out. The doctor decides to explore the sibling rivalry factor, and Annie just keeps going. She says she thinks Max has it in his head that his brother is cooler, more successful, and hotter than he is. And at this point, the doctor seems to be worried about another man's baby batter because she's now asking if Brooks is single and she'd love to grab a cup of coffee with him. The couple now heads back home and just as they arrive, they see their neighbor, Gary, come out to check his mail. He's in his police uniform and carrying his dog. Max reminds Annie to not mention game night to him and immediately he starts talking. You can see why. He's just a weird fellow. But as they head into the house, Gary straight up asks them if they have plans for a game night tonight and they say no. Max and Annie now head into the house and they're trying to figure out how to get their visitors to park far away and sneak in quietly so Gary doesn't figure out what's going on. Max says they just invite him, but Annie says no. Debbie was our friend, and Max was just the creepy husband that we had to put up with. He's only gotten worse since the divorce, she says. As they're talking, they hear a loud thud outside. They move towards the window to go check what it is, and it's just their friends coming in from the window. They were asked to sneak in, after all. The first girl that comes in is Madison. Yet another Instagram model girlfriend Ryan is bringing to game night. Then Michelle and Kevin, who are married, come in through the other window. The entire group teases Ryan about how he always loses game nights, because of the dates he always brings, and we're shown some of his blasts from the past. As his conversation is going on. We find out that Kevin and Michelle met at 14 and got married at 19. Ryan thinks that's gross. Anyway, straight to the games. Max says they start with charades, but Annie says they should wait for Brooks. The mention of the name gets everyone excited, and they all start talking about how super successful Brooks is, and Max is already over it. Just when Max tries to go ahead with the games, Brooks arrives in his super loud but super sweet Toyota sports car, which happens to be Max's dream car when he was younger. Max goes out to meet his brother and Gary, who they also call Robocop, is now outside his door watching everything. They head in and Brooks says he loves Max's house, because he reminds him of simpler times. Okay, I think I see why Max doesn't like him, but this is just the beginning. The game star and Brooks pauses to tell an embarrassing story about Max when they were younger, even after Max forbid him from telling it. But Brooks is killing the games, though. He gets seven, but Max gets zero. Everyone failed him, even his wife. Actually, especially his wife. Game night is now over. Everyone is leaving, and then Brooks asks that they hold the next one at his house. Cool. Next game night comes, and as Max and Annie are about to get in their car, they see Gary, who asks them where they're headed. They say Brooks' house, and Gary asks them if they're going for another game night. Max says no. They get in the car and head out. And boy, is Brooks' house huge. They go in and meet the rest of the guys. Of course, Ryan is with another lady. This time, not an Instagram model. He's here with Sarah, who's head of corporate communications at the office. She's Irish. Brooks says the game they'll be playing tonight will be so epic that they won't be needing boards and pieces. Ryan asks if it's Rich People's Fight Club. He has mentioned this before. He seems pretty obsessed with the idea. But obviously, that's not it. It's murder mystery. Whoever finds the victim wins his sweet sports car. Crazy incentive for Max, isn't it? Anyway, they just hang around now and wait for the game to start. Two guys are in a van outside the house, by the way. As the guys wait for murder mystery to start. They decide to play Never Have I Ever. Along the line, Ryan says, Never Have I Ever Been With a Celebrity, and Michelle drinks. Oops. She says she was drinking separately from the game, and it was only a coincidence, but Kevin doesn't seem to believe because she's breathing fast now. As they're still arguing, they hear a loud knock on the door. It's a man in a suit. He introduces himself as Agent Henderson, FBI. He distributes dossiers which contain clues, which they'll require to find the kidnappers. As Agent Henderson is asking if anybody here has food allergies, the men from the van barge into the house with masks on. Henderson doesn't know them. That's not a good sign. They knock Henderson out easily, but Brooks is holding his own with the two guys. The rest of the guys are just watching because they think it's all part of the game. The men carry Brooks to the kitchen where the heated battle continues. Meanwhile, the guys are in the living room feasting on cheese. Relatable. Brooks makes his way back to the living room and the guys now come and tape his mouth and take him away. Kevin immediately gets back to the issue of his wife and the celebrity and she says it was before they got married, during a certain break they took. Never take breaks with your girlfriends, fellas. Anyway, the game has begun and each couple heads off with their dossier of clues. First clue. With shiny fangs, my bloodless bite will bring together what's mostly white. Max thinks Brooks might be trying to humiliate him with his game. And he says, then let's not play by his rules. She picks up an iPad and an iPhone and boom, they're off. They're tracking Brooks' location. Sarah and Ryan see them leave, and that prompts them to move quickly. So Sarah checks in Brooks' wallet and calls his credit card company to ask for the last few charges he made. She wants to find out the name of the murder mystery company they use so they can go there and bribe to get the final clue. Meanwhile, the only couple that has been able to figure out the clue is Kevin and Michelle. It's a stapler. Of course, I knew that. They go into the office, see the stapler, and there's a flashlight.
flash drive there. They insert it in the computer on the table and see another riddle. While they're trying to figure it out, Sarah's got the name of the company, so they're heading out now. But on the way out, Ryan locks Michelle and Kevin in the office. Why did he do that? I don't know. He just wanted to be a jerk. We now see Max and Annie arrive at a dump site. That's where Brooks's phone is. They think Brooks figured they were tracking him and threw it there. They look across and see one of the guys who burst into the house earlier. They say he's one of the actors, so they follow him inside the bar. They ask the bartender if he has seen someone who looks like Max. He says no. They think he's in on it. Anyway, they order a drink and moments later, a man comes out of a room and they quickly catch a setting of Brooks in that room with his head covered. They're excited. They're going to win the game. Annie now takes out a gun she retrieved when Brooks and the guys were fighting back at the house. She believes it's a fake gun, so she's brandishing it as she delivers a line from Pulp Fiction. All the three guys in the bar assemble and she tells them all to get on their knees. She then tells them to do a yoga pose because she thinks it's all still fun and games. Meanwhile, back at the house, Kevin is still obsessing over the celebrity Michelle was with. She says she doesn't want to tell him because he'll obsess about it even more. So he says he's going to guess and she should let him know if he gets it. She says okay. He's guessing as he's climbing trying to find a way out of the room but he gets distracted and falls off. It's an unfortunate fall but fortunately it's enough to open the door. Let's quickly head over and see how Ryan and Sarah are doing. They just arrived at the office and as they're walking inside they basically start teasing each other. Oh they definitely like each other. They head into the office and there's just one woman in. She's sitting in her chair and facing the wall. They turn around and she looks like she's dead. She has a headshot wound but she wakes up and shouts. Apparently she only just came back from playing the corpse at a murder mystery thing and she dozed off. She's pregnant by the way. They now try to bribe her for the final clue. That's if you can call this a bribe, because he's just sliding over 10, 5, and 2 one dollar bills super slowly. $17 in all. That's all he has. A grown man. Sarah steps in and gives her $100, and they get the clue. It says, look in your jacket pocket. It's a confusing clue. Meanwhile, back at the house, the guys are finally finding out that all that has happened is not part of the game. Adrian Henderson finally wakes up, and the real guys from the game finally burst in with their own clown masks. They definitely chose the right mask, because look at them coming half an hour after Henderson arrived. They ask Agent Henderson if he's okay. His real name is Ryan, by the way. But we already have a Ryan, so we'll just stick with Henderson. Henderson now calls a lady at the office. She puts the phone on speaker as Henderson tells her what happened, and everybody is shocked. What do you mean the fight and abduction wasn't part of the game? Let's quickly go and see what's going on with the kidnappers and Brooke, shall we? Annie's dancing around with the gun she still doesn't know is real, while the kidnappers are lying on the floor. Max searches the guys and finds the keys of the door, so they go in and lock themselves in. They remove the cloth covering Brooks's head, and they're gloating in his face. Brooks is trying to say something, but Max and Annie are more interested in taking a selfie. They take their picture, and then Max gets a call from Ryan. He thinks Ryan is calling to beg for help with the game, so he ignores the call. Just about that time, Annie rips the duct tape off Brooks' mouth, and he quickly tells him that this is not a game. Just then, the kidnappers outside smash the glass on the door and start trying to make it into the room. As they're struggling with the door, Brooks tells him he's a smuggler. Basically, he's in some serious trouble. Max and Annie are still struggling to believe the whole story. Annie jokes about the gun not being real, so she shoots at the ceiling. And boy, is it so real. She immediately throws it to the floor, and that sends a bullet into her husband's hand. Blood starts pouring out, and they can now see how real this is. So Annie unties Brooks, and they all run out just as the kidnappers break down the door and start chasing. They manage to make it to the car and drive off. In the car, Brooks starts confessing. He says he has been lying the entire time about what he does. He actually buys and sells sussy stuff for people in the black market. And he made a mistake getting into business with this guy they call the Bulgarian. He wanted Brooks to find this Fabergé egg. He did find it, but some other guy named Marlon Freeman was willing to pay twice as much for the same egg. So Brooks, being a crook, screwed over the Bulgarian, and that's why these guys are after him. And they very nearly catch up to him, but Annie is doing a pretty impressive impression of Vin Diesel, with the way she's swerving away from them. Annie and Max suggest going to the cops, but Brooks says they can't. The Bulgarian has a ton of moles in the police department. The guys chasing are not stopping, so Brooks decides to sacrifice himself like the biblical Jonah. He tells them they won't stop until they have him, so he jumps out of the moving car. Annie and Max try to go back for him, but the guys start shooting at the car, so she just zooms off. Max starts feeling faint, but they can't go to the hospital because they'll call the cops. So Annie has to take the bullet out herself. She goes to get supplies to do her little surgery. She gets a call from Michelle, who tells her they're about to talk to the cops. Annie tells them not to because Brooks' life depends on it. Then she heads over to her husband to get the bullet out. She's now following the instructions in a little handbook, and at some point, she makes a large incision, and both of them start holding back a pew. It's a really funny sight, I tell you. You know what's even funnier? There's actually no bullet to remove. The bullet went in and out, so she just gave Max a cut on his arm for no reason. They do their little puke holding competition again, and we cut back to Brooks's house, where Annie and Max have joined the rest of the guys. Annie updates the guys, and since the Marlon Freeman name is only an alias, the first step here now is to find a police computer, so they can find his actual name and address. And where can they find a police computer? Come on, take a guess. Robocop. They need him now, so they all march to his front door and act like they all just want to do game night at his place. He lets them in and they start playing Jenga, but just one move in and Max has to use the bathroom. Of course, he's just trying to get to the computer. He locates it and goes to log in. We all knew the password would be Debbie, didn't we? He types in Marlon Freeman and the man's real name, which is Donald, and all his details pop up. Max picks up a pen and starts running down, but what he doesn't know is that his blood is dripping on the rug. He also doesn't know when Robocop's dog comes in, more blood drips on him. He finally notices the dog, and now he's trying to get the blood off. Nothing is working. Max gives the dog a little bath with a bottle of water, and that just makes things worse. The dog then goes ahead to do that shake that
the dogs do, and now blood is everywhere in the room, on all the Debbie pictures and frames. At that point, he just gives up and goes back downstairs. He ends the game and all of them leave immediately. They're now heading to Donald's house, and Max gets a call from someone who says they have Brooks. Max tells them they're going to get the egg, and they can just easily do an exchange. The guy gives them less than an hour to bring the egg. They arrive at the house, and Max tells them to all head back home and he'll go in alone. They all say no. They're all in this together. We all need friends like these, honestly. The house is massive, and it looks like Donald has a little party going on. So they just walk in freely and go down the stairs. And guess what? It's a fight club. Ryan's living his dream. Anyway, the guys decide to split up and go find the egg. And guess what? Kevin is still obsessed with the celebrity Michelle was with, so she finally tells him the story of how she met Denzel Washington at the gas station. And one thing led to another. Yes, that's the guy she thinks is Denzel. She really thinks she was with Denzel Washington. But bro, that's Denzel Michigan, at best. She shows Kevin the picture and he straight up tells her that that's not Denzel. As she's arguing and she's listening to the words coming out of her own mouth about Denzel Washington living in a two-bedroom condo, she realizes what she did to herself. Kevin just laughs at her and does a little impression of Denzel, the real Denzel this time. While these ones are having fun, Max and Annie are looking for the egg in the office and get talking about having a baby along the way. Apparently, Max doesn't really fancy the idea. He thinks children will hamper their chances of fulfilling their potential. Annie is not really happy about this. She tells Max he doesn't really want to be Brooks. He wants to be Brooks, and she leaves. Downstairs, we find out that Ryan was right to stay back and watch the fight, because as one of the guys opens the safe to put some money in, they spot the egg. Sarah tries to strategize for a minute, but Ryan doesn't do strategies. He just walks across the room and takes the egg from the safe. But unfortunately for him, one of the fighters goes down right in front of him, so everyone turns to see him and sees him with the egg in his hand. Donald asks who he is, and why he has the egg, and Ryan throws some lies which don't stick, so he decides to run. Everybody starts chasing him. He sees Max and the rest of the guys upstairs, and they literally just start playing football with the egg. They're throwing it to one another, from Ryan to Michelle to Kevin to Annie to Max, who's immediately slammed to the ground by a guard and drops the egg. It falls downstairs, but thankfully, Sarah was there to catch it. The fighter guy nearly gets her though, but Ryan comes out of nowhere and spears him to the table. Now I'm sure they sell a different type of glass to rich people, because how come that table didn't just shatter? Anyway, they all now run out of the house with the egg and drive off. Can you say it's touchdown yet? Oh, wait a minute. This is the opposite of touchdown, because Kevin slams on the brake too hard, and the egg falls off Max's hand and smashes to bits. They find out that the egg is even fake. It was made in China. But then, Annie sees a note with a list of names, and it appears that it's that note they need and not really the egg. Anyway, they're here now. They drive up to the guys, and instead of an easy exchange, the guys tell them to get on the ground, all of them including Brooks. While they're on the ground, Brooks is asking Max why he came. The Bulgarian will just go ahead and kill all of them now. Max says he had to come because he's his brother. He can't just let him die, even though he deserves it. Isn't that just so sweet? Brooks goes on to tell Max that he's a better person than him. He starts confessing to all his cheating back when they were younger. He cheated during Battleship, Monopoly, and even in the game of life. He saw Max go to college, get a job, marry an amazing woman, and he knew he couldn't keep up, so he went into the life of crime. Brooks, this says a lot about society. Brooks goes on to tell Max that that's what the whole game was supposed to be about, making it up to his brother. This time, he cheated to let Max win. Remember the last clue? Check your jacket pocket? That was for Max alone. He checks his pocket, and the key to the car is there. Oh, and by the way, the kidnappers put a call through to someone while all this was going on. And now, they hear the guy say, you want us to kill them all? And everybody's like, what? We got you what you wanted. But just before he shoots, a cop car arrives. And guess who? It's Robocop. He claps the guys and practically saves the day. He says he figured they were in trouble from the moment they came to his door. That late to initiate game night. Then of course his dog being drenched in blood and Max's search history gave the rest away. They start thanking him and boom, Gary gets shot to the chest. Apparently he didn't clap all the guys. One is still alive and he shot Gary in the chest. Gary goes down and he seems to be giving up the ghost. He says he has no wife, no friends, so what's the use? Max and Annie are by his side. They tell him he's got them. Max promises that once they get him to the hospital and stabilize him, he'll be invited to every game night. Gary then says, don't you ever exclude me again and Max says never. Then boom, the act is over. Gary spits out the blood capsule. It was indeed all an act. Everything. He says, and that is how you do a game night. The kidnappers at the back get up now. Robocop says when he realized they stopped inviting him for game night, he hijacked Brooks' murder mystery party and staged a kidnapping of his own. What better way to prove my worth as a game night participant, he says. Apparently, the kidnappers are felons. He agreed to shave some time off their parole in exchange for this. So Annie asks if the Fabergé egg, the list, the Bulgarian, was all him. And Gary looks really confused. He looks at the list and says it's the list of people in the Federal Witness Protection Program and asks them how they got it. While that's happening, two big guys come from behind and shoot Gary. Now that's the danger of playing games like this, because Max sure thinks it's still part of the game, but he puts his hand in the bullet hole and actually sees a bullet. Now he knows it's real. As Robocop tries to call for backup, the guy with the pistol kicks him to the ground, and the other guy asks for Brooks. You guessed it, that's the Bulgarian, and I'm a little surprised he's speaking pretty clear English. He says they've been tracking Brooks all night, and now they'll have to kill him. Max then intervenes and tries to negotiate the freedom of his brother by offering the list. The Bulgarian says deal, but Brooks says no. You give him that list, he's gonna kill me, he says. So he snatches the paper from Max and swallows it. The Bulgarian says they're just going to cut it out of him in the jet, and they take him away. Brooks begs Max not to follow him, but did you think for a second that he would not? Even though the guy shot the tires of both cars there, they make their way to Brooks's house and take the new car. So while the Bulgarian 
plane is about to cut Brooks' stomach. They see the car running towards them at full speed. The pilot tries to take off quickly, but you know how long planes run before they fly. That's more than enough time for Max to take out the wheels, and the plane pretty much crashes before it even gets in the air. But they're not safe yet. The guy with the gun comes out of the plane, and Annie quickly runs out of the car and goes to hide. Max's door is stuck, though, so he takes a little more time to come out and can only crouch behind the car. The guy nearly gets Max behind the car, but Annie makes some noise, so he walks towards where she's hiding and starts looking for her. Max is trying to tell her to turn on the belt, but she can't hear, so she asks him to charade it to him. Apparently, it's always fun and games are these too. Anyway, he gets the message across, and she turns the belt on, but it's so incredibly slow, and it does nothing. Okay, maybe not nothing. It distracts the guy, so Annie is able to come from nowhere and smash his head with a fire extinguisher. He immediately goes down. Max says he noticed a hatch on top of the plane, so he'll get in from there. He tells Annie to go call for help. Inside the plane, the Bulgarian is just waking up, so he starts approaching Brooks with a knife, but he hears footsteps on top of the plane and goes to check what it is. Just then, Max drops down and points the gun at the Bulgarian and asks him to put the knife down. He instead puts the knife right in Max's bullet hole and then wrestles him to the ground. Annie, who's calling for help, notices some movements in the plane and heads over with her fire extinguisher. The guard shows up and points a gun at her. Unfortunately for him, though, the men struggling in the plane hit a button, and the guard is sucked into the engine and is immediately blended like fresh tomatoes. The fight is still going on, and Max is holding his own down for someone who's new to the criminal world. Unfortunately, though, the Bulgarian gets his hand on the revolver, and just as he's about to clap Max, the fire extinguisher drops on his head from the hatch. Miss Fire Extinguisher to the rescue again. Max ties the Bulgarian up while Annie cuts Brooks loose. After that, Max kisses Annie and tells her he wants to have a baby. He used to think he wants Brooks' life, but he can now see Brooks as a loser. While they're kissing and saying a bunch of sweet stuff to each other, Brooks starts clapping and saying, that concludes game night. He tells them they learned everything he wanted them to, and says, Trevor, you can get up now. But he's only pulling their legs. They were ready to pounce on him if this too was part of the game. Three months later, they reunited Brooks' much more normal looking house. He has an ankle monitor on, so you can say he surely left the life of crime. But he went out with a bang. So that list he swallowed, yeah. He later pooped it out, and sold it on the black market for $3 million. But he's not a monster, you know. He tipped every one on the list that they were in danger for $20,000 a piece. As soon as the ankle monitor comes off, he'll go and buy that house he was renting and move in with his girlfriend. And can you guess who that is? You're smart, aren't you? Yes, Max and Annie's doctor. There she is. Everybody now gets back to the game, including Gary. Annie now takes the marker and draws a bun in the oven on the board. Of course, Max is the first to figure it out. She's pregnant. They have really gone full circle, haven't they? It's really beautiful, isn't it? However, what's not so beautiful is these two guys in a van outside the house, cocking their guns and getting ready to head into the house. Anyway, Gary's dog now leads us into his basement, where Robocop planned out his reinstitution into Game Night. It's an incredibly elaborate plan. If I was this dedicated to finding out about Bitcoin a decade ago, I would have been a billionaire by now. Moral of the story, rich people are never happy.